Uh, so our next speaker is Felix Binder. So Felix, you can already start sharing your, your screen if you are ready. Yep, so is this working? For now, yes. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> so thanks a lot for um, for organizing this conference. Uh, it's a shame not to be in South Africa in person this time around. Um, thanks also to the speakers who've gone before, uh, especially to Janet, who has nicely set the scene already on the topic that I want to talk about uh, earlier today, um, when she was speaking about extracting work from quantum coherence. Um, so I'll speak about uh, quantum coherence and ergotropy, which is a specific type of uh, quantum work. And um, the talk will be based on uh, this paper here, um, together with Gianluca Francica, uh, Mike Mitchison, Giacomo Garnieri, John Gould, and Francesco Plastina. So let's get started. Um, so a simple question that one might ask, um, if one is given a quantum state, how much work can be extracted from it, right? From a non-equilibrium quantum state. And the answer of course depends on uh, the, the setting, right? Are we in an asymptotic regime or uh, what are the rules of the game? And uh, one way that this has been approached is uh, to go back to uh, Thompson's version or Lord Kelvin's version of the second law which can be paraphrased as, as here from a closed equilibrium system during a cyclic variation of a parameter by an external source. And so of course, this here refers to the uh, equilibrium system and we are interested in particular in a non-equilibrium state uh, and how much work we can extract from this. But we can take this as a basic and keep the second part here, which is the cyclic variation of a parameter by an external source. So more concretely, what we will allow is a cyclic variation of a Hamiltonian. So the external source is the external driving, which is in this part. Um, and we require that this be turned off before the protocol and after the end of the protocol, after some time tau, uh, say. And then this entire driving is, of course, gives rise to a unitary evolution. And we can safely categorize the energy change during that evolution as work uh, because it's unitary. Um, and I will use the sign convention here where we're speaking of a, a positive quantity as extracted work. Uh, and you can see this down here where rho prime is the output state and rho is the input state of this evolution. Um, so what, how much work can we now extract? What's, uh, it, it, can we say something about this? And, uh, of course we can, and uh, this quantity is known as uh, something called ergotropy, uh, which goes back to, uh, it's defined first in this paper down here, but really goes back to the uh, two papers above there, which talk about a, a microscopic derivation of the thermal state in terms of something called passivity. So what do we do? Um, we start in, the, in our state row and we want to now extract as much work as we can by this cyclic unitary um, transformation. And so really what we want to do is we want to go to a state with as little energy as possible so we can extract as much as possible. Uh, such a state is called a passive state, a state from which no further uh, work can be extracted in a unitary transformation in, in the fashion that we've just said. And in, it has the form as is uh, given here. So it is diagonal in the energy eigenbasis with populations ordered such that the lowest energy has the highest population and then uh, increasingly to the, higher, to the higher energy levels. Um, so there is no population inversion in this state. And an example of a, a passive state is the thermal state uh, or any thermal state uh, at any temperature. Um, and I should say, so the, the ergotropy, the work that we can extract is just the energy difference between these two. We can, we can give a, a formula in terms of these quantities here, but really it's just the energy difference between the input state and this lowest energy state, uh, this passive state that we can reach. And this is generally larger. Um, so the energy of the state is above that of the thermal state, which means 
we cannot extract what is known as, um, as the non-equilibrium free energy as is given down here in general. If we're doing this with a single system, but if we look at the limit of processing infinitely many of these states in parallel, identical copies with a global unitary, we approach the limit where we go to the thermal state. And that's the specific thermal state that uh, has, so the temperature is defined for this state to be of the same uh, for Neumann entropy as the input state. Yeah? Um, so I hope this makes sense, but keep this in mind as we'll come back to this uh, later on. The difference between the ergotropy and uh, this, the energy in this thermal state is called the bound ergotropy. Um, so to illustrate this very uh, simplistically and very briefly, um, people would usually say the ergotropy now, it uh, quantifies work extraction from coherences, which I've illustrated here on a cut through the Bloch sphere. Um, so let's say uh, we take a, a state on the, a pure state on the equator of the Bloch sphere um, and we can bring it to the ground state and the energy difference in this process uh, is the ergotropy. So this is, uh, we can think of as work extraction from coherence and the other type of extraction uh, of course comes from population inversion. Um, as you can see in the, in the second, uh, graph over here, um, which is, it seems like a more uh, classical feature. Um, and what I want to present today is uh, a more precise way of stating this. In particular, uh, we can actually say more precisely um, what part of this ergotropy is due to coherence by making use of the resource theoretic framework. Um, and I assume not everyone is familiar with this, so let me just introduce this quickly. A resource theory of uh, quantum coherence, uh, in a nutshell, um, applies to any scenario where we have a fixed uh, orthonormal basis that we we start with. In this case, this is uh, quite straightforwardly the energy eigenbasis uh, of our Hamiltonian, and then, of course, incoherent states are the ones that are diagonal in this basis. Then. Secondly, we require a set of free operations and there's various classes of these. Um, never mind, I've uh, outlined the a, a class called strictly incoherent operations here, but this is actually not so important uh, since we're just talking about unitaries. So if you look at this part here, we will allow uh, this class of unitaries of which we are sure that it does not uh, create any coherence. So this is basically, um, it, it, uh, it allows us to do permutations between the energy eigenstates and uh, it can also have a glob global phases in it. Um, but of course, these don't have an, an effect on the, on the output state. And then what this allows us to do, and this is, uh, this is one of the things that uh, any resource theory tries to achieve is it gives us uh, a monotone. So this is a type of measure um, of coherence in, in a state row. And this is given by the relative entropy to the closest free state, so the closest incoherent state. And it turns out that this can be expressed as the entropy difference between the fully defaced state as here and the original state itself. Yeah, so this entropy difference uh, we'll hold on to. That's a monotone for coherence and uh, allows us to quantify it. Um, and we can see in a minute that this is, is going to pop up in the uh, coherent ergotropy. Um, so let me let me quickly illustrate now uh, the process that we have in mind in this uh, graph here. So we're starting in the state row for uh, normal ergotropy uh, extraction, and um, we bring this to a uh, passive state. That's the uh, generic ergotropy extraction, uh, and then the energy difference in this process, so this entire thing. Uh, is the ergotropy. Now, if we're restricted to um, incoherent operations, or in particular to incoherent uh, unitaries, we cannot um, we cannot change the coherence of the uh, of the state. So this is why this is depicted as a horizontal line here. Uh, instead, we go to the lowest energy state that's available with incoherent operation. That's the sigma rho here. Um, and then this difference 
and down here we call the incoherent ergotropy. So that's the best that we can do with an incoherent operation. So this is a sort of classical, if you will, a, a classical part of this energy of the entire ergotropy. And the other part we then call the coherent ergotropy. We could additionally, but this has no, um, in, in, for the purposes of this talk, uh, has no energetic effect. Um, we could also then decohere the state, uh, deface the state entirely. So to project, uh, project it onto its diagonal uh, part. And then we, we would end up with the state down here. Uh, this is the part that Janet was talking about earlier, but in a, in a different framework. Um, alternatively, for the same process, we can derive the same thing um, by looking at it in a slightly different way. Um, we could think of first defacing the state um, to a diagonal state, this uh, delta rho here on the right, and then extracting as much ergotropy, again unitarily, uh, as we can get out. It turns out we end up in the same state over here, uh, and the in incoherent ergotropy defined this way uh, has the same value. And again, uh, the rest is then the coherent ergotropy. Um, so let's put this all together. This is both of these approaches uh, put in one graph. And then I mentioned earlier, this uh, non-equilibrium free energy, uh, which is this part down here, which is, so this energy difference between these two states is, uh, is always positive um, and generally not zero. So in other words, the resulting, uh, passive state is not necessarily thermal at any, there's no temperature necessarily for this to be thermal. Um, if we actually look at the state uh, that has the same, the thermal state with the same entropy as this uh, passive state or the original state, uh, and we take the, the energy difference between these, this is exactly then again, the uh, bound ergotropy that I mentioned earlier. I just wanted to highlight this one here, that that's this part. We can also actually write this all out as a uh, precise equation and not just as a graph um, and, and give an expression for the coherent ergotropy. And you can see this down here. So um, it's the sum of the coherence, which is in the state, uh, so in the original row, uh, and these two uh, non-equilibrium free energies, these two relative entropies with respect to any thermal state. So you're allowed to put in any thermal state and the beta uh, over here is just the temperature uh, with respect to which these are evaluated. Um, but of course, the thermal state that has the same entropy is of particular interest uh, in this context. So now we can take this and we can, uh, we can formulate some, we can bound it from above and below uh, to get a feel for it. And, um, what we what we can show is that both of these bounds can be saturated. So the upper bound uh, on the right hand side is saturated. If this part vanishes, uh, let me, if this part vanishes, and the lower bound is saturated if this part vanishes. Um, and it both can be done. The physically more interesting uh, case is the saturation of the upper bound, which occurs whenever the original state has a thermal spectrum to start with. So the state is not thermal, but it has a thermal spectrum, uh, which is trivially the case for qubits, uh, because if any uh, qubit can be written, any passive qubit state can be written as a thermal state. Uh, and it's also trivially true for Gaussian states, since any Gaussian state can be written as a, uh, as a unitary transformation on a thermal state. And um, so both of these are, are interesting uh, examples of this, uh, but of course the temperatures have to match for this uh, bound to be saturated. Um, so this is, this is uh, in a nutshell, uh, what I wanted to say about the coherent ergotropy. To summarize again, uh, we are able to split up in a precise fashion, the ergotropy into a coherent and an incoherent part. Um, the Coherent ergotropy, I should, I should point this out, uh, is a, of course, an energetic quantity, but the expression for it is entirely 
uh, composed of entropy, so information theoretic expression. Can actually just go back quickly and uh, see this down here. So the thing on the left uh, is an energetic quantity, but we express it in terms of these information theoretic quantities on the right, uh, where the energy hides in the thermal states effectively. Um, to give some perspective of uh, what sort of thing this is interesting for, um, first of all, of course, um, we know that uh, something that this community has uh, perhaps come to over the, the last few years is that work in quantum thermodynamics is not a necessarily, there isn't a unique quantity that quantifies it, but what we call work depends on what operational scenario we have in mind. This is illustrated in this paper by Wolfgang Niedensu and others up here. Um, there has recently been a, a number of publications where uh, coherence and ergotropy uh, appear in the steady state of an open systems dynamic, and there's been some interest in that. Uh, so this ergotropy relationship uh, allows us to, to make this relationship a bit more precise uh, between these two. And then lastly, I'd like to point at uh, two papers, but these are just uh, two of it, a number of papers in this direction of um, quantum engines where uh, people have implemented quantum engines taking a, a spin degree of freedom of an uh, ion in a, in a trap uh, as a working medium. And then the work can be um, put onto a, a something called it a quantum flywheel, which is taken to be a, a harmonic oscillator degree of freedom or the emotional degree of freedom of the ion. And in this process, it's not uh, a priori evident which part of the energy that's picked up by, by this motional degree of freedom uh, should be work and should be heat. So what people do is they use the ergotropy to quantify the extractable work. Uh, what this work that I've just now presented allows us to do is to break this down further and say there's one aspect of this which we should attribute to coherence and one aspect of this which can be uh, extracted with incoherent operations alone. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention um, and questions, I guess. Okay, thank you very much, Felix. Um, let's wait a little bit. Mm -hmm. Questions? Hello. Hi, Felix. It's Marty. Hi, Marty. I can't actually see the video while I'm on this thing. So thanks for, for saying, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry, I, I just got unmuted. No, I was actually wondering, I mean, as you mentioned, as you take copies, you can go to this thermodynamic limit where you get uh, non-equilibrium free energy. So do you know how this quantum contribution behaves? Like, um, I mean, did you consider that? Uh, the easy answer is no. <laughs> but do you um, have an intuition? But like, let's see. Do you expect that one will be yeah. slower, the other one faster? I don't know. So if you do think... go to the plot, right, that you are showing, it was quite nice. You yes. had this. Um, yeah, this extra part. This so one now here. if I would take two copies, how, how would this look like, right? So I, I, I would think that the um, there is no further coherent ergotropy to okay. be extracted uh, after, by even adding a single further system, by going from one to two systems. Yeah. Because usually the way in which the uh, this further part activates is by this is just combinatorics, yeah, no, right? right? And no, I mean, you're you're an expert on, yeah, on this, of course. Yeah. Um, so as you add more systems, they're already yeah. diagonal, but you can combine them better to bring them to a lower uh, energy. Yeah. Does this make yeah, sense? Yeah, totally. Okay, thank you, <laughs> and take care. Okay, uh, we have a question from Chago. Hi. Hi, Felix. So I, I just wanna, I mean, as far as I remember from the talk of Janet in the morning, she was saying that in her process that you do this measurement, that the, the coherence would be, I mean, would be actually convert to heat. And here in your case, it, it's work. So I mean, 
is it the, that depends on the process you you raise your coherence it can be work or heat i mean i still confused about who. thanks for asking this i i might have made that connection a bit better actually um and I, I didn't think of this when I was making this presentation, but I'm glad that Janet was talking about exactly this earlier. So Janet basically considers this as a process, right? You start from from this from the state row up here, and um, then you do this measure and forget the thing in the energy eigenbasis, and you end up down in this state, right? Um, and in the process, you can extract some work. Um, what if you look at this? Uh, ergotropic framework, what you do instead is you actually do this uh, evolution here. But um, so it turns out that this coherence is exactly what uh, what is this quantity down here, right? I should try to use the same color. Um, so I think these are uh, two sides of the same coin, even though, and maybe this is the interesting part, they're quite different approaches to doing this, right? So in other words, to, to phrase it and say it shortly, this, this work is indeed extracted and it shows up in the, ergot in the coherent ergotropy down here in blue. Um, it just manifests a bit differently because we're not, we're not trying to stay on the same, we're not trying to convert a state to a state with the same average energy. We're really trying to extract as much work as possible uh, in this framework. Whilst what Janet is trying to do, and, and she'll correct me if, I, if I'm misrepresenting this, is to really just go from the coherent state to its projection uh, without extracting the remaining amount of uh, energy that could be extracted otherwise. Yes, I mean, but I just thought that, I mean, that th this case, the energy that was changed in, in her process, that it, she called it heat, no? I mean, or, I mean, if I'm... yes. So this is this is referred to as the uh, quantum heat, and, and Janet was talking about this uh, this earlier as well, and I think it came up in in response to um, Alberto's talk. That's a question of uh, how you look at it, of what you allow yourself to operationally, what you allow yourself to do. Um, so this also occurs, for instance, in in fluctuation theorems. If you take an initially thermal state, you basically do the inverse of this in a quantum fluctuation theorem, but you start from the you start from the thermal state, uh, and then people call this depending on on what paper you read, they call this uh, irreversible work, or they call this a heat because the state is assumed to relax back down to a thermal state. It's not exactly the same, but it's an analogy. Does, okay, does that make I sense? I hope. Yeah, I guess, yes. Okay. Well, God, I thank you very much uh, for your question. And thank you very much, uh, Felix, for these interesting talks. Uh, so yeah, due to the time, we are still slightly late. 